Uh, good evening, everyone. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you, God, for your goodness and grace. Thank you for this great community and city, God, that you have given us to live in and be a part of. Father, I thank you for Mayor Fox and the councilmen and women that are standing with him. Father, imparting wisdom and helping to lead and guide this great community. I pray tonight, God, that you would fill them with your wisdom and with your grace. And as they move in that wisdom... Father, I declare, God, that our city be, will be filled with peace. Our streets will be safe. Our families will be joyous and prosperous. And God, our businesses and industry will flourish. And Father, it'll be a delight to be a part of this community. And people will come from afar to be a part of it. So I declare that tonight over this meeting and over this city. And I give you praise for it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I pledge of the Regis of America.
Chase has something very special she wants to do. Ready? We're going to let her go first. I think we can take the class off if you want to, kid. I know that there are people who are homeless and uh, if we can get a school and a local business, we together they c can tell them to be teachers and the teachers can teach the homeless people and people who want to be construction workers can fix the broken down houses and the local business can give the school money and the school can give the homeless homeless people money and then the the cons the houses that can the construction workers made they can buy those houses with the money that the school gave them. come down front for that. Jane Reisenbicker. She has served the city of Cape Girardeau for over 24 years. She was hired on October 28, 1996 as an auditor for the finance department with her title changing to accountant in 2004. During her career, Jane has been instrumental in process and control changes which have enhanced the efficiency of both the finance department and the city by increasing the accuracy of interfund personnel costing, investment reporting, improvements in cash reconciliations, budget preparation, and many more areas within the finance department. That's a lot. <laughs> Jane will be remembered most for her extreme accuracy, dependability, and commitment to the city. Although her departure will leave a great void, we want to wish her the very best in her retirement. And I have a plaque that says an appreciation and recognition of over 24 years of loyal and faithful service to the city of Cape Girardeau, presented this first day of April 2021 by the city of Cape Girardeau in honor of the retirement of Jane Reisenbecker from service to the finance division. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. <laughs> We also have the beautiful business property of the month, and that is Southeast Health West Campus. Is Jennifer Ebert here tonight? I don't see her. Well, anyway, that's what it looks like. It's beautiful. If you've not been seeing the Southeast Health West Campus, it is beautiful. Couldn't get it all in one picture, so I will give this back to you and make sure she gets that. Thank you, ma'am. Make sure I turn my mic on. Grace told me sometimes when she walks on, watches on Facebook Live, she can't hear real well. So <laughs> the masks don't help that much, but uh, I hope that they got to hear her very well because she had a very good presentation. Uh, next on our 
uh, agenda is the presentation from Old Town Cape on an update. We got Doc Kane with us tonight. Thank you, Council. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank you for putting me after Grace. Uh, I mean, I mean what, what could possibly you know, happen here? Uh, I am Doc Kane, owner of Fort Cape Girardeau Restaurant, and this year's board president for Old Town Cape. Uh, our great director, Liz Haynes, who many of you have met and know, uh, could not be here tonight because she lost her voice. So at 7.30 on Easter morning, she emails me and says, I can't talk. Okay, so, you know, I'm in the restaurant business, so Easter is really not a very big day for us. So I was just so glad to receive that email at 7.30 in the morning. However, I am here tonight, and I'm here to tell you that Old Town Cape is thankful for the partnership we have with the city. I think it's a good thing for all, in, all people included. Uh, we have some board members here tonight, and I would like them to stand up and introduce themselves. Right here. Danny Yeshner. Chris Conway. And of course, your representative. So, we are a thriving organization. Even though the word thriving is not a very good word from the last 12 months. However, in that setting, our staff has managed to reach our fundraising goals, roll out new projects, and get ready to go for 2021. And that's what we have done. Our staff is amazing. Our boards are amazing. Our committee people are amazing. And you should be proud that you have people that work on these committees looking at all things we can do to make our area, Old Town Cape, a better situation. So I'm not going to bore you with a lot of statistical information. I'm going to give that to you. But one thing I would like to say is that on Water Street there, we've been trying to get the mural lit for, I think, about 20 years. Or ever how long the mural's been there. And I hope you've noticed that the mural is lit. And it is such an addition to the riverfront area. It makes it more safe. It's much more appealing. So that was my pet project. And then Mr. Danny Esner took that on and he got it done with a lot of help from all of us here and the city and some private uh, money and public money and contractors went into this deal. We've added some new events. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with those, but more, more or less the Monster Car Bash came on in 19, uh, I mean 2019, the Outdoor Holiday Bazaar, and then of course our Christmas tree lighting, which I think is a great event. It's just going to be a tremendous tradition as we go forward. Uh, some of the things we did not get to do, but our staff came together on our fundraising especially. We would have our annual dinner, people would attend, we gave out some wonderful awards, and we also raised money. Well. This year we did that virtually, and it was just tremendous. As a matter of fact, we probably got more exposure doing this online and on social media than we would if we'd had our annual dinner. So the innovation that's going on in the Old Town Cape office and with the board and with the committee members that we have, I can assure you that you are in very good hands here at Old Town Cape. Uh, we appreciate the relationship that we have with the city. And we think that between the private money that we have and our investors and the city council that we have here that believes in what we do, we think we're positioned very nicely to get out of this pandemic and go into 2021. So I've got some information for you. I'll give it to you, but I'll answer any questions if you have any, or I'll get some information from some of these board members. We're just thankful that we have a community with a lot of volunteers and a lot of heart for the downtown who love it and give their time and energy and give their money too to make Cape Downtown one of the best areas in the Midwest. Well, it's, you know, we are extremely fortunate and you know, Old Town Cape was born out of the old Downtown Merchants Association and I've been on my corner down there for 32 years and I've been involved with that organization and this organization ever since. And the majority of people that are in these uh, blocks that we call Old Town Cape, they share, they share our vision, they share our passions, and they're there because they want to be there. And so we want this to be as good as it can be. You know, our riverfront market's going to fire up here on May 1st. And boy, we're looking forward to that. You know, because even under the innovations, remember when we had to do the drive-by market at the casino parking lot? And quite honestly, it was pretty successful. But man, the, the riverfront market, we're getting ready to kick it off. We had over 80 vendors at our 
uh, pre-market meeting that was held as a rest at a restaurant downtown. I won't mention the name. <laughs> <laughs> but that was very nice. So people are ready to go. We are ready to come back and go strong. And Liz and her staff are tremendous, and they are excited and ready to go. I will tell you that I learned today that uh, the American Planning Association designated two places in Missouri as 2021 great places in Missouri. One was the Cortex Innovation District in St. Louis. The second was Broadway Street in Cape Girardeau. Awesome. That's fantastic. From Pacific down to Main Street. That is fantastic. So and another the award I for downtown. Say, just along that line, we always have a vacant property night or something. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we had a vacant property open house uh, a couple of weeks ago. And even though the weather did not cooperate, we had the most properties ever listed in that tour. And so it tells me, and we had tons of people coming by, it tells me that property is available and people are interested in doing something with it. And when you have things like that happening, you know, that's, that's always the plus. It's, that's always the plus. So we were really excited about that. I think we'd only had about 10 to 12 in the past, but we had 25 properties. And they were getting well visited by people, even though it was cold and kind of rainy. So there's, there's, there's a lot of good things in the, in the future, and um, we, we hope that you will continue to be uh, uh, our partner at Old Town K. Okay. Thank you, Doc. And I'll leave these things with you guys, and you can look them over. <clears throat> Thank you all for what you do. Our next presentation is by Community Partnership of Southeast Missouri on tiny homes. Good evening. I'm Dr. Melissa Stickle. I serve as the Executive Director of Community Partnership of Southeast Missouri. Thank you for having me here tonight. I'm very humbled that you guys asked me to present. Like our young mayor-elect Grace, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, innovative solution uh, to ending homelessness, chronic homelessness here in our community. And um, oftentimes our default mode is the most expensive, least efficient, and least successful system ever devised in order to uh, provide for this homeless population that we're experiencing. So at our last point in time count, if you're not familiar with what a point in time count is, uh, one cold night in January around the entire nation, we do a count of our homeless population, both sheltered and unsheltered. We know that this number is grossly underrepresented as it's a pretty cold uh, January night and people are hunkered down. So finding people to count becomes an issue. Uh, at our last point in time count, 44 people were identified without regular fixed housing here in Cape Girardeau County. 25 of those were identified as unsheltered living directly on the streets. The remaining were sheltered in uh, some shelter, most likely safe house for women. We estimate that we have up to a dozen what we call chronic homeless here in Cape Girardeau. Chronic homeless is our most difficult population to serve. It's frequent bouts of homelessness, uh, not just episodical, not just transitional. Um, this population is uh, likely to have multiple barriers, and so they're frequently homeless over long periods of time. Again, based on the service that our agency provides to this community, we can easily identify about a dozen chronically homeless right here living on the streets in Cape Girardeau. All right, I was told I have about 15 minutes for our presentation and I do like to talk, so I'm gonna try to make this as brief as possible. I would say that tonight's presentation is just a conversation starter uh, as we continue to explore this. So while I might be brief, I hope that after this, um, anybody who's curious, anybody who has questions, they take an opportunity to reach out to me and, and get more details. <clears throat> All right, so in the early 2000s, we actually saw what uh, we call this rise of tent cities around the United States. So we don't really have an experienced large tent cities here in Cape Girardeau, although we have had some small pockets of uh, 
tent cities, if you'll, tent, tent areas um, around uh, our community. Um, but this is really where the research began to start in identifying how can we take what we might learn from tent cities to do something better. And so, sorry, maybe. Uh, so the researchers back in the early 2000s identified that there were some really good things that came out of this tent city model, um, particularly around this peer support, people uh, with shared experiencing experiences coming together. Um, also, you saw a lot of direct democracy where they voted on things, where there was actual some symbolism of governance and self-management and just creative ways in order to uh, be safe in this tent city environment. Uh, but what we really want to know is, is there a way that we can take these dynamics but improve the physical infrastructure of tent cities? Because oftentimes times tent cities were uh, very unhealthy and also very unsafe. And so from there um, became uh, these models of bridging the gap between living on the streets and the conventional housing options, which are largely expensive uh, as you're looking at development costs for even low income housing um, developments, uh, there's, it, it becomes a significant cost for this population. Um, also a very interesting thing. And when I said earlier that uh, our basic uh, default solution is very ineffective and very expensive. So data will actually show that it costs between 20 and 40,000 per person per year to leave a person on the streets. So it becomes a very cost ineffective method to leave a person literally homeless. All right, so these methods or uh, models of bridging that gap um, started to take the form first as a, what they call a sanctuary uh, camp where it literally was tent city, but in a uh, safe and legal place so that cities weren't um, moving these tents around and around. Here's a great example, one in Oregon called Rest Stops. Uh, and then we started looking at another model called transitional villages, which um, were a little step up from that. So you move from tents to just a basic bedroom supported by common facilities that had like restrooms and kitchens and um, similar to like a campground cabin style. Here's a great example of one in Oregon con called Opportunity Village that was built in 2013. And then lastly, we, ha we have a, a more long-term solution, which is called an affordable village, uh, which is uh, a much more radically accessible and sustainable place to transition to. It's, and it's also more cost-effective than traditional development. Here's a great example um, called Emerald Village. There's actually a lot of these villages around the United States. Here's just a few of those. So Dignity Village started out as a tent uh, city that was moved around very frequently. Uh, the city decided they needed to do something about it and they actually donated the land for which this uh, village um, is now built. And it is actually considered the pioneer of tiny home villages. It was built in 2001. It's one of the very earliest examples. Here's Nicholsville, another tent city, moved around um, multiple times, vacated, moved to another location, vacated. Uh, a group got together and they decided to build this tiny home village. What's interesting about this one is it's built on a single family lot. So right in the middle of single family dwellings. And it is used as an example to demonstrate that these tiny homes can actually successfully coexist in neighborhoods. Here's Camp Coyote. Another example of a tent city. Uh, they transformed their tent city into a tiny home using very creative funding streams, which was also sponsored by the city. So this one is actually funded by HUD and also community development block grant funds. <clears throat> Here we have in 2011, an initiative called Occupy Madison. Uh, they did something neat with theirs. They decided to renovate a building instead of um, do, doing new things. So they renovated a uh, car shop and did their common facility in the middle and then surrounded it by nine tiny homes. And these remaining pictures are just a few other uh, pictures of tiny home villages around 
the nation to demonstrate that the idea that I'm presenting tonight is not an original thought. This has been done very successfully um, all over the United States. All right, so what makes up a tiny home uh, village? Well, obviously tiny homes. <laughs> so these are compact structures, 400 square feet or less. Uh, they're all supported by a com uh, common building in the middle. Typically, it'll have um, shared kitchen, laundry, sometimes showers, if showers aren't available in the tiny homes, uh, and then space for services and gatherings and meetings and such. Um, all of them in, uh, involve residents in the decision-making process. So this is part of that governance model out of the um, tent city. And then everyone that lives in a tiny home village model uh, has a basic set of community agreements that they have to abide by in order to stay there. And then by and large, all of them uh, are sponsored uh, and, oh, sorry, and all of them have a village meeting regularly, and then all are sponsored um, by some nonprofit which provides oversight, safety, administration, um, general oversight of the whole project, so it doesn't become like a, the quintessential um, tent city. So the community agreement um, really is just a basic set of rules and um, principles. Every uh, tiny home that I researched has one. Um, they vary on what's included, but uh, Essentially, um, there's no violence, no theft, no uh, alcohol, drugs, no persistent disruptive behavior, and then somehow contributing to uh, the maintenance of the village. So oftentimes you'll see people living there if they're not able to pay rent, that they do have some sort of job um, or uh, cleanup duties or some, some duty uh, in order to be part of um, the maintenance of that. All right, so the benefits of the uh, village model include, well, one, it's a very cost-effective way to be, uh, meet basic needs. And uh, it does preserve what we call privacy and autonomy. Someone asked me when we were looking at tiny homes, um, why not build a shelter? Why not build duplexes? Why not build an apartment building? And there's something to be said about a tiny home village really reaffirming a person's dignity and their privacy and autonomy. Uh, it also creates a very supportive community setting. What we've seen in all um, the research we've done, and we went, went and visited one in Texas, that these tiny home villages really become a community and a neighborhood. Um, so really they're bonding together and it creates that um, supportive environment. And by and large, in all the research I've done, uh, these tiny home villages have actually had a positive impact on the surrounding community. So just a few things that a tiny home village will have, um, certainly outside volunteers, support meetings, uh, classes, workshops, some sort of community events. Oh, skipped one, sorry. Uh, and what, and, and most importantly, uh, a safe environment. So I do believe that probably the, one of the most common things that people are going to say is that, is this going to be safe? Um, are people going to be safe there? This is actually a quote from a police um, lieutenant in Oregon who says it's gone better than he thought, really thought it was. He was extremely skeptical, skeptical in the beginning, um, and states that it has not become a burden to the neighborhood in terms of crime impact. <clears throat> Everything we do is with partnerships. This wouldn't be any different if we were to move forward with this project, uh, bringing lots of people around the table to serve this population. Again, chronic homeless is an extremely hard population to serve, uh, needs a lot of support in order to get them um, off their feet. There will be some resident admission criteria. Uh, our focus, if we were to do this project, is on chronically homeless. Uh, again, there is a, a larger number in Cape Girardeau that are homeless, not just chronically homeless, but we really believe that this uh, is a model that could solve chronic homeless in our um, community. It is the most expensive to the community. It's where uh, most of your police calls are, your frequent users of the emergency room visits. Um, they're the ones that are uh, got the most frequent calls for being around and out and getting hit by cars and traffic like this is the population that is causing a uh, significant cost burden to the community and so serving this population in this way would really be the most cost effective 
So there's some other um, admission criteria. Won't go through that. I'm not going to play that video, but I will send it to you guys because it's an ex excellent video. Uh, these are just some pictures. Every tiny home village looks different. Uh, it's based on the community needs, the community surrounding area. It's inside of one. Here's some little schematics. They range from anywhere from two to 400 square feet. Some of them have a loft. It depends on a person's mobility, what makes sense for a person. All right, so our agency, our job is to explore ways to provide services to not only this community, but to the most vulnerable in this community. And so this is an idea that our agency has that we're exploring. We do have a potential location that we would love to put this tiny home village. Um, uh, if you're from, most of you should be familiar, we purchased the former Cape Girardeau police station, which is just five weeks from opening, by the way, so everybody needs a tour. Um, right around the corner, you can see right literally behind it, uh, is the federal building and then right to the south of that is FCC's um, transitional house and then there's a vacant lot where the old family support division office was torn down and that 1.21 acre lot would be an ideal location for us to do this tiny home village. Uh, it is zoned central business district so it would be appropriate zoning and the proximity to our um, agency allows for us to provide that administration and oversight to ensure that success. Here's a little bit closer view. We would like to see 15 tiny homes on this 1.2 acre location with a common uh, facility in the middle. Questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, I, I'm not sure if you've done this in your research and considering this type of tiny home village, but have you actually surveyed any of these chronic homeless individuals in Cape Girardeau to find out exactly what their needs are? Oh yes, so that is one of the number one things that we do out of our agency is work very closely one-on-one -on -one with individuals that are experiencing homelessness. We have street outreach, we have case management, and we have a lot of dialogue about the services that we want to provide, can provide, should provide. And yes, uh, they serve as the best focus group for uh, our agency in leading the projects that we do. Okay, and in your presentation, you had said that you're looking to primarily serve the chronic homeless, which you said was 12 individuals yeah, at this we, point in time? Yes, we estimate that there are at least a dozen chronically home that would fit the criteria currently residing here in Cape Girardeau. And how many homes are you considering putting on this? 15. <clears throat> Melissa, in all of your uh, research and everything, have you found any examples of this taking place in a town the size of Cape? Because Denver yes. and, and Wisconsin yep. and, you know, Portland, those are four million person cities. Yes, so there are some examples um, in your packet. Most notably is going to be the Emerald Village. It's in Oregon, but not Portland. It's in a smaller community. Um, Springfield, although it's is larger, if we're looking at Missouri, Springfield has one, Kansas City, the bigger metropolitan areas have one, and most of that has to do with um, funding and ability of a nonprofit to support it, where you don't see um, the capacity of nonprofit partners in the more rural areas. <clears throat> and also rural homelessness looks completely different from urban homelessness. Um, where you can go camp and tent and nobody knows you're there and it doesn't it's not top of the um it's not right there visible for county commissioners in rural area and so you don't you see them less frequently in more rural areas with a facility like this what do you see um, as an attraction number from outside of our community <clears throat> so that's a really good question um so our goal is to serve the current Cape Girardeau homeless population that we have. There is plenty of need here. Uh, when people ask me if we build it, will they come? Um, you know, my response, I have lots of responses to it, Robbie. Uh, 
one, I get a little on my soapbox and say that I moved here from a small rural town for a job. And as uh, many probably in this room maybe are not from Cape Girardeau and have relocated to some other area for some other resource. And then I think about uh, Cape Girardeau itself is a draw for resources. So take away a potential tiny home village. We have two hospitals. We have a mental health hospital. We have a VA center coming in. We've got a university. And so the natural draw of people in our surrounding areas is to come to Cape Girardeau because it's a resource-rich resource area. Uh, to add a tiny home village, uh, I do not firmly do not believe that it will create a draw of homeless individuals to our community. Um, I do not believe that there is a network of uh, homeless individuals that they call up their homeless friend from down in the boot hill and say, come to Cape Dorado because we got really awesome homeless services up here and you got to get one of these tiny home villages. Um, I, I believe that naturally there is a tendency for people to draw to Cape Girardeau and we need to serve the people that are here and are coming regardless of what we build. And if we don't build something, they're coming anyway. Okay. I, <clears throat> I would like to start off just by, um, I think organically within the community, some of these resources for sheltering these uh, homeless individuals have popped up, you know, Salvation Army, Safe House, which you mentioned, um, People's Shelter, Community Partnership. I commend your leadership um, with the programs that you have with, with partnerships with the local landlords to provide them with apartments or with hotel rooms, et cetera, uh, to really find a place, especially in the, the harsh winter or summer uh, days. Um, have you seen is there an oversaturation of demand for those resources, an unmet need that this is filling? I mean, I feel like that prepares them for what their next step would be with being a tenant in one of those facilities and really getting them into those that's already existing resources. Sure. Um, I gotta think about the answer to the first question about oversaturation of needs. But what I would say is that looking at the population that this project would serve, our chronic homeless population, the, they are the least likely to actually move and transition to what we like to call self-sufficiency or on their own where they can live in an apartment and pay rent and have a job and be what people like to call upstanding members of the community. This population probably won't get to that place for lots of reasons, whether it's a disability, whether it's mental health, whether it's addiction, whether it's PTSD, whatever, whatever the issue is that's causing them to be chronically homeless, it is not likely to be a, a solution. Income generation to be self-sustaining is probably ho hopeless. Um, it feels almost hopeless, right? It's a long, long journey to take a person who is literally chronically homeless to get to that point. So while we would love to be able to transition people to the housing support that we offer, because we do have quite a bit of funding that we support people with eviction preventions, um, deposits, rental assistance, people who are episodically homeless, transitionally homeless, uh, individuals who are affected by COVID or affected by domestic violence or affected by they got sick and couldn't pay, you know, their mortgage. Like we have funds for that population. Our biggest gap in financing and funds is a solution for the chronically homeless population because it is the most difficult, most cost, it, it costs burdened uh, population to serve. And a lot of people think an emer a shelter is the appropriate way to solve that and an emergency shelter is actually a very cost inefficient uh, and ineffective way to serve this population. I don't know if I really answered the, que the first question about the oversaturation. We do have a, quite a number of funds for housing services but not for this population. Okay. So you're, this is a very specific subset. Yes. And who, with that population, I guess in my mindset, the goal would be to eliminate homelessness is our goal. Chronic and, homelessness. Well, I mean, in general, all I'd love to of homelessness, yes. and you're saying this is identifying that yes. one specific. Yeah. 
um, portion of that demographic, um, or one por one demographic. Uh, I guess the goal would be to eliminate that. And I feel like, if that is there some is there some plan to offer or transition them into those programs to where they could eventually sure work if, beyond this? Into absolutely. Those? I mean, our our mission even says that we want to move people to self-sufficiency that's ideal right for everybody mm -hmm. i think the reality for people and what people need to understand is the reality says that a person that's chronically homeless is a long 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 road to getting to where people would consider themselves sufficient and people have to be okay with understanding that it doesn't mean it's impossible it means it's going to take a lot of work uh but studies and research will tell you that you can go much further if you house a person first so hud which is a national organization subscribes by housing first it says we house people first then we work on substance use mental health finances all of those things because housing them first is a much more cost effective way to get all those things accomplished in the long run so we we house first and then i guess the other part of it is I'd like, you know, your residence requirements and, and contracts and what they have to abide by. How is that going to be enforced? It seems as if there needs to be someone on site around yes, the clock so it will to be, manage this. It, will be, it would be staffed uh, by some title we haven't called, some sort of coordinator, uh, manager. Um, some models have um, some residents who have uh, where they trust and to, to do peer um, coordination and then some models use interns and some models have staff that live on site so we're still exploring all of those models um, to see what would make the most sense for this community in that model so you say, okay. you, say you want to do housing first and you want to bring chronically homeless people who generally usually always or most of them have either alcohol problems or drug problems and you want to house them first but yet your contract says they can't use drugs they can't drink are you immediately going to stop that when you house them so it doesn't say they can't use it says they can't bring that on site so uh this would not be a dry place uh people could certainly um be drunk in their homes just like people in homes in my neighborhood could be drunk if they so choose to um, what wouldn't be acceptable is to bring drugs and alcohol on site and we see it and it's out there and it's on the premises that would not be acceptable behavior okay it's a fine line well, there's a fine of people's line there. privacies of people's self-determination uh, and housing first is there a limit as to how long a person could stay there if they're transitioning so our goal for this model is likely a permanent affordable solution so if a person still needs that permanent affordable solution we're not going to kick them out that kind of goes against uh, our vision of housing people the only real solution to ending homelessness is housing uh, if we feel like a person is ready to transition then absolutely we would do that and um, we have a professional set of social workers on our staff who work with people all the time on moving them across that spectrum working on plans and and goals and getting to another step and so yeah that would be the goal if possible to me that doesn't seem to solve the problem though if you've got a homeless person you can go out and use drugs and drink and then come back and if you give them a place to stay they could be there forever sure i guess we can um uh I can see that perspective, um, but I would say that the goal is to work with a person to understand that that's not the best solution for them to continue to be in their addiction and help provide services while they're housed so that hopefully that they will move. Um, it's better than them being drunk on the side of the road next to a school it's a better solution than what we have now a much better solution it, the well the i guess the point is that you would consider the, these people to be drunk and unemployed and and forever on the street if not yes i mean that's, would the, be, that's the they, group that you're talking so about our alternative solution is what i said earlier the default mode 
of leaving people on the streets right. and they would be on the streets in their alcoholism, in their mental health crisis, in their way that they are now and we'll continue to have that as our solution to homelessness in Cape Girardeau and I think we can do better. Well, what you've shared has been, uh, uh, some of it I've, I've not heard before and I appreciate what you're saying but, and it sounds like your organization um, is very knowledgeable about the different types of situations that homeless people here deal yes. with. Yes, thank you for that. I would say that our organization is very knowledgeable. Not only were we 33 years into our inception here in Cape Girardeau County, um, uh, our housing programs have been in operating over 20 years, and we also serve as the Missouri Balance of State Collaborative Applicant in ending homelessness in 101 counties. Um, so I, I hope we know what we're, <laughs> we're doing. Okay. Melissa, I was just going to have one statement, and yes. um, I don't think and you, you all are a, a strategic partner of ours, and um, we value everything that, that you all are doing in the community. And with that, I would say um, addressing homeless is something that I know that we've had some sub-conversations on and, and applaud this, this effort. What I personally struggle with is that this is something a, a little unconventional. It reminds me of container homes in, in a lot of ways and tiny homes that we've had sprout up. And I, I just, I mean, Robbie to Melissa mm -hmm. and everybody listening, I just don't know if our community is gonna go for this. And I don't know if it fits. And we're gonna have to have a lot of discussion about this uh, to see legality on, on zoning and what that does in our community and what it does to, quite frankly, our downtown merchants. Um, it, I, I, I personally believe, and I would, love to, I would love for you to show me statistically that I'm wrong, mm -hmm. I'm afraid that this is going to become a revolving door of homeless coming, not just the problem that we have, mm -hmm. but a lot of other communities' problems coming to Cape Girardeau. And we look at crime and we look at mental health and we've already got some challenges already. So inviting more of that, I, I just, we need to have a lot of discussion about yeah. that. And, that, and that's me being very fair and honest with you. On, sure, on yeah, that no, statement. I expect fair and honest. Like I said, this is a conversation starter. Um, I would say that um, there are multiple communities around the nation who have made this happen, made this work very successfully. I've also included in packets on your table um, several communities where they have what they have done for their ordinances and zoning. Um, also several newspaper articles for tiny home villages that have been very successful. And of course, I will share this PowerPoint um, with you that, uh, oh yes, it's in there in your packet so that you can reference other, um, other communities that are doing this very successfully. And you know, Robbie, I'd love to have, you know, conversations with you about your concerns. Um, my, probably maybe my parting feedback because I know it's a long night um, to say that our community won't go for something like this is to say alternatively our community wants to keep people on the streets homeless and that should not be acceptable I, I understand that but I think there are alternative methods outside of a tiny home I don't think anyone up here or the community says we want so I, I don't really appreciate that comment like that but we'll leave it at that I can I I understand Thank I you. and I would love to hear these alternative solutions as well this is not the only solution it is a viable solution and that's what I want to commend you for is thinking outside the box and presenting yeah, this to us absolutely. you know and we don't know what options are out there until someone like yourself with expertise comes and presents it to us but um, I guess I struggle with I see these being successful in communities where there's already such a homeless issue that these tent communities are developing on their own and they're mm -hmm. and the skid rows of the war, you know communities and we I don't feel like we have that issue we have some homeless issue but not enough to where they're collectively and, and that's where I want to hear more about what the current issue is we all know the one-off examples of people that are chronically on different corners mm -hmm. but what is what is the need to build in this infrastructure mm -hmm to then have this whole entire community because we're not replacing an existing mm -hmm. transient 
tent community mm -hmm. and be building a community. Although there has been some tents um, on lands here in the city that have had to be um, removed. And uh, Cape Girardeau is interesting because it's cross, it's so close to rural. Um, it's like right on that fine line. And like I said earlier, rural homelessness looks a lot different. And so you, uh, oftentimes it's hard to find our population to be very visible because they're hiding in the woods or they're places where you don't see them because we're on that little fine line between rural and urban. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's interesting because we have two strategic partner organizations here tonight. Mm -hmm. And from people that I've talked to that are members of the Old Town Cape organization, I've heard about the homelessness issue. And people have brought that up to me and people have called me to talk about that. And so there, there needs to be some synergies here. There needs to be some conversations between Old Town Cape and the people they represent, community partnership and the people they represent and to see how it would impact the city of Cape Girardeau. How is it going to impact the, the health of downtown? How is it going to impact the chronically homeless um, conversation? So like you said, this is that conversation starter. Mm -hmm. And so it just leads to future, future conversations. But if there's ever an idea of getting Old Town Cape folks and, and community partnership folks together, I would love to hear what comes out of those conversations about how to improve and embedder downtown Cape. Because that's what I've heard, you know, there, where the homelessness issue is highest is in the downtown Cape corridor and how it could in the future affect our businesses. And also to piggyback on that is, is, is it a homelessness issue or a panhandling issue? Because all the panhandlers aren't necessarily homeless. And then is that really the complaint of the downtown merchants versus sure. the homeless? And is this going to combat the panhandling or worsen it? And Maybe nobody knows. Let's also <laughs> just remember that these are individuals, they're human beings mm -hmm. that have individual problems that are not blanket across the entire group. And so they require individualized assistance. Mm -hmm. So regardless of how you create an, a community agreement or how you organize this, this structure, mm -hmm. is that it would have to be specific to the individuals that you're yeah, serving. Absolutely. And unfortunately, with the amount of individuals that we're looking to target here, I, I just, I worry that some of these individuals, if they are part of this community, might have to be removed. And so then now, where are we going to take those individuals that were removed from my home situation, and then, then where do they mm -hmm. go because they've broken some type of rule? Mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a complicated issue, but mm -hmm. we just have to, to be cognizant that every individual is going to be different, and which is why I asked if we've surveyed these people, <coughs> um, those 12 people, I want to know what their needs are. Mm -hmm. I think the council would like to know what their needs are. That's great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, just uh, a couple of uh, things uh, for, from, from a staff standpoint. We, um, we currently do not have a tiny home uh, development code or building code. So uh, there's one that exists, the, the newest building code that we, international building code that we haven't accept, uh, adopted yet, does have one. It is something that we could look at uh, bringing in and, uh, and and establishing, you know, what are the what are the specifications, what are the building uh, specifications, and those types of things. Uh, what are the design standards, and and then also um, the other thing is we don't uh, have within our zoning code um, where this is an allowed use and where this is a special use or where or where it's disallowed, and so those are items that. Uh, that staff would be certainly willing to explore with you, but I think probably Jermaine, the first question we would want uh, you all to wrestle with and come up is, do you want them at all? Because if this is a container issue where you're saying we don't want we don't want these at all, then it's a pretty long process for us to research and take this to planning and zoning, have hearings, go through planning and zoning, bring it, and then bring it all the way to you to find out that you don't want them at all. So we're fine with it either way, but before we proceed, we'd like you to, to, to come up with that this, um, and, and, and are willing to do that. The second, the second piece of that is really, a second, to me, a secondary question, and that is the one that you've been asking a lot about is if this, uh, if this solution is the tiny home solution as proposed, which is innovative and, uh, and, and very, very well looks at it in a different way than we've looked at it before, is this a solution that, that you feel is proper for Cape Girardeau and proper in this location? Because that's kind of the one that's, 
that's in front of us now. And so I'm not asking for a answer to those things tonight, but I think it's it's something that you may want to discuss later on in the agenda. Okay. We'll move right into communication and reports. Council? Um, I'm going to jump in and just say what I've said for quite literally an entire calendar year. Um, I, I thank everybody for wearing masks, and I thank everybody for continuing to wear masks in the community. As you can tell, masking and vaccination has been paying off. So we're seeing a, a decrease in active cases of COVID-19 in the city of Cape Girardeau and the county of Cape Girardeau. Um, so please just continue. Let's let's continue until it's done and we can all you know, be completely mask free in the future. So continue to wash your hands, socially distance and wear your masks in public. Thank you. Anybody else? I was going to do the opposite of that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, um, there, I got a report last week that on Friday of last week, there was only one person in the hospitals in Cape Girardeau County, and that was a huge sign. I know that the university is starting to uh, vaccinate students. My oldest daughter is going to be getting a vaccination this week, and so for her to be getting one this early in students, I was pleasantly surprised that that's being rolled out at, at the uh, university level. And so looking forward to weeks and months to come. Go. Uh, the Keep Cape Beautiful community had their first trash dash on March 27th. Um, we had about, I guess, 13 individuals out um, from three rotary groups in our KCB committee. I see two members here. Um, and it only took us a little over an hour to get 16 bags of trash between Hopper and Arena Park Golf. So we found lots of interesting items, including lots of golf balls. Um, <laughs> And uh, I would like to challenge each council member to organize or participate in a trash dash in your ward. Um, we, we did take our litter tours, so we know already some of the areas that were a concern. Um, Hawthorne was a high litter area in my ward, so I want to make sure that we did that. And the Keep Cape Beautiful Committee will give out t-shirts nice. for volunteers that pick up trash. So right. there's something cool in there for you if you want to participate and just reach out to me and we'll get something organized for you. I also just wanted to mention that on Saturday, April 24th, that is the Friends of the Park Day and the Great Cape Cleanup. So please be thinking about locations and areas to help um, clean up and registrations at 8.30 at Capella Park um, to participate in our beautif beautification events. So look for forward to seeing you all there. Okay, anybody else? If not, I'll go. Uh, Wednesday this week, uh, I learned today that uh, I was asked to be uh, at Central High School Wednesday to greet Senator Blunt as he will be here to uh, uh, talk about COVID issues and, and uh, COVID money and so forth. So I will go down there and greet the Senator. Uh, I have had a couple of discussions with his staff about the docking facility and whatnot, so I'll be anxious to talk to him. Uh, also this Thursday, the 8th, the American Duchess will be the first cruise ship, cruise boat to dock downtown. Uh, they're following a little different procedure with COVID. They're not going to let people get off and wander yet. Uh, people will get off in groups, small groups of less than 25 and board a bus and they'll do, they've got a set tour that they do around the city and around the area. Uh, but at least the, the boats are beginning to move up and down the river again. Also, Thursday at 5.30 at the Vasterling Suites, uh, there's a public art reception in honor and revealing the sculptures that are up and down Broadway. I think there are seven of them. Uh, are they up yet? All of them? Okay. I, I hadn't seen, of course, I can't drive all the way down Broadway now. <laughs> Hopefully that'll be corrected soon. But uh, it's always an exciting thing when they put new sculptures out there. Uh, it's a really, really a neat program. And uh, the, the downtown merchants and the, and the people in the city have supported it and it's gone very well. So that's all I've got. Scott? That's all I have. Okay. Are there any appearances this evening uh, by advisory board applicants? I don't see any. Any appearances for items not on the agenda this evening?
crowd kind of thinned out. <laughs> if not, we will move into agenda review. Uh, thank you, Mayor. We have uh, one public hearing tonight. Uh, it's a public hearing to consider rezoning of Hawthorne Road uh, from R1 to R3. Um, so we'll have that public hearing and then we will vote on first reading of that under item number 18. Um, on our consent agenda, we have the second and third reading of the truck routes removal. They have removed two, two from our truck routes. Um, and then we have a series of demolition contracts at 1237 North Water Street, uh, 1112 Harmony Street, 1237 Water, North Water, and 529 South Benton Street. So uh, moving forward with uh, the demolition of uh, some of those uh, properties that uh, uh, is uh, uh, a healthy and uh, good thing to continue to do. Um, then we have uh, on number eight, a uh, performance guarantee with SEMO development for the Hopper Crossing project. And a uh, that's for phase one and phase three is the number nine uh, with the same CMO development. Uh, then uh, number 10 is the uh, performance guarantee with uh, Meyer Properties at Touchdown Ridge 2. 11 is the uh, agreement that we have with the uh, U.S. Uh, Aviation Academy for office and hangar space for the new flight school out at the airport. That's a milestone. And then um, number 12 is the uh, a project to extend a water line and basically make a loop uh, to give us redundancy in our water system on Cypress Road. Uh, Nip Kelly will get that contract. And then uh, 13 is the contract for services for Old Town Cape that you heard from earlier tonight. And 14 is a special use permit transfer of ownership at 3451 and 3457 Williams Street. I believe that's the car wash. So uh, are there any items on the consent agenda that you wish to have removed? Um, no, but on 14, I need to... Uh... Oh, abstain due to financial conflict. <laughs> All right. So noted. We do have uh, several new ordinances tonight. We have some record plats. The first one is in Cypress Grove subdivision. Um, are off of Edgewood and, and um, Bloomfield Road, I believe. And then uh, 16 is a uh, record plat for Highlands at Hopper Crossing, Phase 3. 17 is the record plat at Touchdown Ridge 2. 18 will be um, the, many, uh, <coughs> the uh, change in zoning for the public hearing that I mentioned earlier. 19 is a uh, for the jury offices uh, to uh, have the permanent utility easements for their connection of water out there on Route K. And then 20 is a fat oil and grease uh, change to that ordinance. This allows, um, as we did this fat oils and grease uh, ordinance several years ago and it uh, requires restaurants and those to, to follow certain parameters. Uh, one of the parameters we have is they have to have them clean so often. Um, some of the businesses came forward and said that's too often for our type of business. And we said, okay, well, that'd be fine if we would, you know, we, then we, but we need to come out and inspect it. And so you need to have fees to pay for that inspection, which will be less than being pulled off. So this was a good compromise to do that. Um, and then we have appointments 21 through 24, Mayor. And uh, then if you want to do other business, you can do that. And then we will have closed session tonight. All right. We do have a public hearing tonight. A public hearing to consider a request to rezone property on Hawthorne Road from R1, single family suburban residential we district. We, oh, we do we need, need to. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. We need to Make call the roll to and adopt, adopt the agenda. <laughs> and a roll call, maybe. Too. Right. I'm jumping ahead, trying to get this over with. <laughs> That's what a move is at. I can yep. just check. He's just checking to see if you guys were all Pay attention. Had it together. You see if we were awake, huh? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Roll call. Roll call. Bruce, Roll please. Box. Bobby Guard. Oh, here. <laughs> uh, Robbie Guard. Stacy Kinder. Here. Shelly Moore is absent. Dan Presson. Here. Nate Thomas. Here. Shannon Truxel. Here. Now I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda, please. Is that a move? Second. 
Motion made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Now we'll have our public hearing. To consider a request to rezone property on Hawthorne from R1 single family suburban residential to R3 high density single family residential. Anybody here this evening to speak in reference to this public hearing? Hello, Jerry Jones, uh, 2609 uh, Saddle Ridge Lane, Cape Girardeau. I'm the developer uh, and owner of this property. Um, it's going to be uh, R3 is what we're asking for, uh, duplexes or townhomes. We haven't got a final plan yet, but uh, that's what we're looking for. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has or you want me to give a presentation of any kind regarding the project. No questions? No, nope, don't right. think so. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. You. Thank you for coming, Jerry. Appreciate it. Anybody else to speak in reference to this issue at the public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. Are there any individuals who wish to make comments for any other items listed on the agenda this evening? Nobody wants to talk. If that's the case, Eric, we'll move right into the consent agenda. Bill number 21-36, an ordinance meeting schedule W, section 26-137 of the city code by repealing various truck routes in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, an ordinance meeting schedule W, section 26-137 of the city code by repealing various truck routes in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 21-37, a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a demolition contract with Ronald Lucera, Jr. for the demolition of a building located at 1237 North Water Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill number 21-38, a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a demolition contract with Ronald Lucera, Jr. for the demolition of a building located at 1112 Harmony Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 21-39, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a demolition contract with Logan Blevins Excavating LLC for the demolition of a building behind, behind 1237 North Water Street in the state of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill number 21-40, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a demolition contract with Logan Blevins Excavating LLC for the demolition of a building located at 529 South Benton Street in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill number 21-41, a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a performance guarantee agreement with SEMO Development LLC for the Highlands of Hopper Crossing Phase 1 in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 21-42, a resolution authorizing City Manager to execute a performance guarantee agreement with SEMO Development LLC for the Highlands and Hopper Crossing Phase 3 in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Bill number 21-43, a resolution authorizing City Manager to execute a performance guarantee agreement with Meyer Properties LP for the Touchdown Ridge Phase 2 in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 21-44, resolution authorizing city manager to execute a lease agreement with U.S. Aviation Academy for office and hangar space at the Cape Girardeau Regional Airport. Bill number 21-45, resolution authorizing city manager to execute an agreement with Nip Kelly Equipment Company for the Cypress Road water main in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Number 21-46, resolution authorizing city manager to execute a contract for services between the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri and Old Town Cape Inc. You have before you the consent agenda. Motion by Dan. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Nate. Any discussion of the consent agenda? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. New ordinances. Bill number 21-47. An ordinance approving the record plat of Cypress Grove subdivision. Second. Motion by Dan. Second by Robbie. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 21-48, an ordinance approving a record plan of the Highlands at Hopper Crossing, Phase 3. So moved. Motion by Robbie. Second. Second by Stacy. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion also carries. 21-49. And the owner's approving a record plan of Touchdown Ridge 2. So moved. Motion by Dan. Second. Seconded by Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
That motion carries. Bill number 21-50, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri by changing the zoning of property located on Hawthorne Road in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri from R1 to R3. Motion by Shannon, seconded by Stacy. Any discussion? Mayor, please mark my vote in abstention due to financial conflict of interest. So do. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 21-51, an ordinance accepting two permanent utility easements from JMD Industries Incorporated and Mid-America Highway K, LLC, for property located at 4072 State Highway K in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. So moved. Well, motion by Robbie, seconded by Stacy. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 21-52, an ordinance amending Chapter 29 of the Code of Ordinances in the city of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, regarding fat, oil, and grease control. <laughs> Motion by Shannon, seconded by Dan. <clears throat> Any discussion? Control, <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion also carries. Appointments. According to the tallies, we have uh, an appointment to the Golf Course Advisory Board, and that looks to be Brad Wittenborn, a reappointment. Submit. Motion by Robbie. Seconded by Stacy. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Appointments to the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, this one was all over everywhere, but it looks like Brianna DeWitt, Phyllis Sides, and Lee Bohr. So moved. Second. Motion by Robbie, seconded by Stacy. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. The others are appointments to the Tax Increment Financing Commission, and those are Danny Yesner and Al Spradling the third. So moved. Motion by Robbie, seconded by Stacy. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Appointments to the Town Plaza Community Improvement District Board of Directors. Those are Scott Blank, Bill Zelmer, and Lee Hatcher. Motion by Stacy, seconded by Dan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Are there other business? Uh, I said I, I said earlier we might uh, Scott would like us to give have some direction as to whether we think it's appropriate to do quite a bit of research on the tiny home issue uh, based on the fact there has to be a building code there has to be the zoning information uh, and it was just going to require a lot of staff time to get that done yes I would seems very broad ranging a uh, lot of different departments and groups and things that um, you know I think we would need input from to be able to make the decision I, I, I agree but I live through <coughs> container houses and, <laughs> and I agree with what you're saying I think it needs to start with us whether we do it I, I am for one not in favor of tiny homes in our downtown Cape Girardeau, just like I wasn't in favor of container homes sporadically throughout our town. I'm just not. I, I, it sounds very callous, but <coughs> it is what it is. I don't, uh, I don't think our homeless issue is to that level. That's my opinion. 12 people doesn't warrant this going in. This would be devastating to our downtown. I've already had numerous people reach out to me opposed those people right there reaching out to me about no way and i i don't want staff my opinion is i don't want staff wasting time on something that quite possibly we come back here and it ends up being a four three vote and we vote it down or, or well, I, 
I, I hear what you're saying. I, I think that's the, the process that we work. We have to, we have to do. Okay. Well, no, I don't actually, know, actually, I don't know actually, we don't. If we know that we have enough votes to not force staff to do that tonight, then we save all that time of staff. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm saying. Okay. I'm so not. you're a one, and I'm <laughs> a so now, okay. okay. So that's what we've done. But now we're one and one. Quickly, okay. Just be clear. I'm not saying I'm totally supportive of this, of this idea. <clears throat> I'm saying I don't know, and, I, and there's a lot of more information that I would like to know to be able to. Make a decision. So if we're does, does this research include the human aspect? And well, I mean, I, I really do think we need to focus on the people that we're they're trying to serve, which that is one thing we haven't heard is directly from those individuals, whether it be some type of survey or or questionnaire or something. That I, I don't know if that's something that staff can do. Is or, I don't know. If we're, I think that's, I, I think that's their I, job. I see. Right. What I, I think again, it's two issues, and yeah. one of them is tiny homes, and and whether you know what those standards are and where they might be zoned, what, where they might be an approved use. So that's one that's one issue that has nothing to do with homeless. Yeah. And then you have another issue that is, is is it an appropriate use for homeless? I think that is more in the back to them to say, okay, bring us more information to convince you that it's a good use for that if we even do it but if we don't but if you don't even want to do it then that goes away too because you're not going to do it for anybody and, and, and that's and my point isn't about the homeless my point is about the tiny homes because <laughs> yeah i i same thing with we've got a tiny home down here in a place that it should have never been put the container homes that we we had a, a spirited debate on a few councils before I'm not for the tiny home aspect, and I would hate to see staff do a bunch of work on tiny homes if we didn't agree for tiny homes. And that's a, that's an extensive amount of resource, and that was the exact point I was going to make, Scott, is there's two separate issues. And on that one, there's an, a lot of resources will be used to develop the zoning and the requirements and, and whatnot. And that would be for all tiny homes that would be considered individually owned or yeah, leased, whereas these are... Homes would be a whole village that who owns them how are the, what's the lease arrangement or not you know whatever that is that's a whole separate issue because once we approve and okay tiny homes for here that then opens it up for anybody to say well you've made the exception here make the exception for us or right. anywhere around town and then the other issue about the homelessness i'd want to hear from well i'd want to hear from our police force that they would probably have the most knowledge because anecdotally, I, I've been told we don't necessarily have a bad homeless problem. Um, is that does that then necessitate a need to develop a whole infrastructure community for what may not necessarily be a need? Before I make that call, I want to know. See, Nate, I appreciate the point you just made about just tiny homes in general because it, I have no professional on this, but it seems like a subject. Uh, that is that is becoming more popular, even for people who are not homeless, but who yeah. choose to live in a people who really want to downsize. Yes, yeah. right. who really want to downsize. And those those so, would have indoor plumbing, and these are not. You know, these are essentially sheds. These are, I mean, they're not even mobile homes. Warehouses. You know. It's, well, now they did they say they're. If they if they set a square footage, they're talking about 200 square feet. That's they right. were saying less than 400, then they would have a centralized managerial or man, centralized hub for showers and whatnot. Yeah, I thought so. she wavered on. She wasn't quite sure on that. Yeah. Well, well here's here's my concern, and I and I agree that it is a each person is a human being, and you have to be concerned for those human beings, but. And the concept has worked well in other places. They are all larger cities with much more severe homeless problems than we have. But I am concerned about the fact that they have certain guidelines that they let people stay there, but yet they're not, you know, when I, when I ask the question, well, most homeless that I have, the chronic homeless, are those who are either addicted to drugs or alcohol and have substance abuse issues and Mental yet issues. they're going to let them go on and do what they do and just give them a place to stay and let them just keep doing what they're doing and they can stay there forever as long as they want to but they're not solving the problem at all now they may have programs they try to get them into 
But most of those people don't want that. So is that, I mean, I know that's the human aspect, but that's, that's then what again, I'm asking. We should be asking these those are the kind of questions that we need to ask. There ought to be other, those ought to be the people that have in other situations rather than, I mean, give them a private room somewhere rather than build them a house. I, I would just say, I'm, like I said, I'm more concerned about the tiny homes and the other residents in our community who all of a sudden can't do anything because we passed some ordinance that's a blanket and now I've got a tiny home on a vacant lot next to me and my property value just went down 20%. I would like to hear a lot more from the community and a lot more from them before we have staff do any investigation and spend a lot of time on it. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, this is the first time that's come to the public mm -hmm. and I would like to give it time and hear from merchants and hear from other citizens in the community before we say, staff, let's do all this research and spend all this time. Mm -hmm. Now, if we get... If we're overwhelmed with a bunch of people that want to do that, then that's a different story. But I think for right now, I think we we uh, leave it like it is and move forward. Okay. Anybody disagree with that? No. Okay. Okay. I do. <laughs> well. I can read a room. <laughs> <laughs> I will entertain a motion that we adjourn to closed session to discuss issues listed in revised section Missouri 610021, including not limited to legal actions, causes of legal action litigation, hiring, firing, discipline, personnel issues, or confidential privilege communication with attorneys. Thank you. Thank you. Mo motion made and seconded. We, all those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned to closed session. Are we oh, doing yeah. a picture? If Shelly well, comes. Shelly's not here. <laughs>